Hello, guys. Welcome to Conversations with Yolanda. And I'm so excited to be here again with you guys today. You know, we talk about entrepreneurship, business startup. I've talked to authors and speakers and people that are out there doing great things. And I want to tell their story. And so today I have my friend Ryan Hall with me from SCCF. And he'll tell you what SCCF stands for. Um, and a little bit about even even the rebranding that they've done with the organization. And so welcome, Ryan. I'm glad you could join me today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Yolanda. I'm really excited to be here. Yes. <laughs> so I, I want you to uh, just open up and just share a little bit about yourself, and then we'll jump into the work that you're doing with SCCF. Yeah, yeah. So um, my name is Ryan Hall, and my official title uh, is entrepreneurial ecosystem builder. Um, yeah, so it's right there, right there in the name. Um, and I work for a nonprofit entrepreneurial support organization uh, called the Shenandoah Community Capital Fund, or SCCF for short. And we uh, help entrepreneurs throughout the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia um, start, grow, and sustain their business by connecting them with entrepreneurial resources mentors, um, just anything that they could they could need uh, on their journey to to success. Great, great. You just mentioned a word that some people may not understand what it means. And so I want you to just expound on that a little bit. The entrepreneur ecosystem. What is the ecosystem? What are, what, what type of work are you doing uh, within that that ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Like, uh, oftentimes when people think of ecosystem, right, that word, they, they go back to like high school biology or, or science class. And they're thinking about like rainforests and, you know, things of that nature and, and, you know, really just kind of like the natural world. Um, but when we're using it, it's, it's really, uh, kind of encompassing of everything, um, entrepreneurial in your in your region or in your city or whatever kind of the geographic scope is that you're looking at. So so for us, the ecosystem of entrepreneurism includes um, all of the resource providers like small business development centers, nonprofits, universities that have entrepreneurial uh, programs embedded in them, um, all of the entrepreneurs themselves, uh, mentor programs or networks, um, funding uh, mechanisms, whether that's traditional banks or um, VCs or angel investors, um, just any anything that kind of touches entrepreneurism uh, is, is part of that ecosystem and plays a role in kind of shaping entrepreneurism for that region, right? And so we try to be... Um, to use that rainforest <laughs> analogy again, right? We try to be good stewards of that ecosystem, almost like, like park rangers, I guess, of of the ecosystem and and help things grow that need to grow and, uh, you know, create opportunities where there need to be opportunities and all sorts of things. Yes. One of the things that I think people don't realize is there are many organizations and groups that are doing work in the entrepreneurship space. And Sometimes people don't even realize the resources that are out there. The, when I first moved to Virginia from Tennessee, I was like, where are the entrepreneur ecosystem builders? Where is the services? Because one of the things that I try to keep from doing is duplicating services. Right. Because it's a waste of funds, it's a waste of time. But when you understand throughout the, for example, the Shenandoah Valley, what's actually available then you won't start something that's already being done. You'll partner with them. You'll collaborate with them. So for me, the ecosystem building piece is, is really critical for not just helping entrepreneurs to grow, but as you said, to sustain. Uh, we, we know that some entrepreneurs will start off and they don't make it. And sometimes the reason is that they don't know about the resources that are out there for them. And I know you guys are doing a lot of work training, workshops, networking for those entrepreneurs. Uh, because um, one of the things I do realize is that entrepreneurship can be a lonely place if you're not connected. 
And so I'd like you to share, you do have some upcoming uh, trainings and uh, programs for people that they can get plugged into. I'd love for you to share, share a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we, we kind of focus our uh, efforts in three core areas, right? And so one is capital and we, we are an SBA lender and provide microloans to, to folks, um, usually folks that can't get l lending through traditional financial institutions. Um, but the other two areas, which I think is more what you were asking about the uh, the community aspect of what we do and the support aspect. And so community aspect addresses that issue that you just mentioned about um, that um, isolation that an entrepreneur can feel, you know, that that loneliness that they can feel sometimes. So we try to create uh, instances where entrepreneurs can join together and talk. So we have um, actually a, an open coffee series that's every, every month we have one. Um, and they are um, sometimes virtual, sometimes in person. So actually the next one, uh, or the one in April rather, that's coming up in Harrisonburg will be uh, live and in person, which is exciting that we can get back to that kind of yes! and event, <laughs> right? Um, but we, we uh, you know, as ecosystem builders, we wanna be open and accessible to everyone, right? No matter who they are or where their idea is on kind of the life cycle. Of, of a business, right? Even if it's just written down on the back of a napkin, we wanna be there to help. So we're actually offering um, open office hours uh, every Monday from 12 to two. Um, so you can hop online, come chat with myself or another ecosystem builder at the organization and learn about resources or ask questions, um, you know, all sorts of different things, whatever you would need. And then from the support standpoint, from the program standpoint, we do offer a, several programs um, throughout the year, um, but our next big program is the Startup Shenandoah Valley program. So that's a, a virtual region-wide business accelerator program. So um, our region, as I mentioned, was the Shenandoah Valley, and we define that as um, uh, Frederick County, Virginia, all the way down to Rockbridge County, Virginia. So we cover the western side of, of uh, the state. Um, along the 81 I-81 corridor. So it's a pretty big area. And so when we were developing this program, we thought, you know, there's no way we're gonna be able to get everybody together in person. So it needs to be virtual, right? Um, and so we were a little bit ahead of the curve there. That was slightly before COVID. So we just had got lucky and prepared for all of this virtual learning before, um, you know, everyone else was forced to, right? Um, mm -hmm. But this accelerator um, is an industry agnostic accelerator. So we take everyone. We've had folks in trucking and logistics companies, cybersecurity mm. companies, manufacturing companies, um, all sorts of things. Um, and that has been really interesting to see the collaboration between those different companies because oftentimes they have the same problems, even though they work in very, very different industries. And so that's been really, really interesting. Um, and it's an eight week kind of coaching program where we go through and work on uh, the riskiest assessments in your business model. So the places where you've kind of assumed something and you've never really tested it out, we want to target those things and we want to know for sure. Um, and we do that for eight weeks. And then because we, again, we want to be good stewards of that ecosystem, we offer wraparound support for all of the alumni of that program after that eight week coaching session. So, um, you know, we're meeting every other week in like a leadership stand-up meeting just to kind of hold accountability with all of the alumni, um, doing workshops on different topics and things, and, you know, to help them kind of build camaraderie across the region as well. I know, um, I know a little bit about the work that you guys have been doing and the, some of the impact. Can you think of a company that has gone through your program and, you wasn't sure about how they were going to pivot or get it get it up and going, but they did and they're doing well. Can you share one of those stories or one that just kind of stood out to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, this is one of my favorite stories to tell just because I love the company and what they do. And, and they happen to be in the same town that I am here in, in Virginia and in Winchester. Um, but uh, this was one of the first companies that I approached and one of the 
companies that joined our very first accelerator. Um, and it's a toy company called uh, Mouse Loves Pig. And so she creates um, these soft toys, uh, screen-free toys, so so no electronics or, or devices, right? And oh, okay. she started this project um, because she saw a need in her own children, right? Um, there was there was a very personal experience that happened with her children and one of the toys that they had, and and she wanted to address that need. Um, and that's really really meaningful, I think, when when you're an entrepreneur, when you fall in love with the problem that you're solving, and you really really go after it, it, it will drive you forward. Um, so much further than than if you're just out there looking for some solution, right? Um, and and so she came to us and really wanted to grow and expand. She'd been working kind of in her basement, manufacturing these toys and and sending them out um, across the country. And so she was able to come into our accelerator and and work on um, some issues that she was having and and develop a plan and a strategy. And we were able to make additional connections to other organizations. Uh, that helped her really scale and grow. And so she's mm. now selling her product, um, I believe, in 61 countries. So she was wow. able to get access to the EU and then other countries in the in North America. Um, and so she's really, really doing well now. <laughs> so <laughs> That is but, awesome. It's, that's so awesome to see when you see them from the beginning stages and then after they've put in the work and got connected and received all the resources uh, that they can thrive and, and be successful. Even though entrepreneurship is hard, I really believe entrepreneurship is about solving problems. I tell students that all the time. I tell clients that all the time. What is something that's bugging you? Go figure out yeah. a way to fix it. And you could make some money. And you know, yeah. we, we, we also see things we purchase in the store and we were like, why didn't I think of this? I should have thought of this. And yeah. so it's it's good to see when someone takes it and, and runs with it. Um, Ryan, why are you doing this work? How did you <laughs> land here from undergrad to graduate school? How did you land in this space? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> that's a that's a good question. I think when I really think back on on it, I probably uh, was exposed to entrepreneurism at an early age and and didn't realize didn't really know what what that was or didn't didn't recognize it and and it wasn't until really I got to SCCF and I realized that you know growing up in rural Appalachia there weren't a lot of pre-built kind of opportunities right there were there were certain jobs that you could go in and be successful and that was you know that that was that right or you could go to college and move away from the area um, so my parents were always, um, doing something. They were, <laughs> they, they owned a farm, they had jobs, they had rental properties, all sorts of things. And so I think I was kind of exposed to that as at an early age. Um, but then, you know, later, uh, particularly in, um, once I moved to Virginia, uh, I looked, um, looked around and saw a problem, right? I personally uh, like to create and make things with my hands. Uh, I would classify myself as a maker. And um, we didn't have access to tools and equipment and things like that oh. here locally. Um, and so I founded a nonprofit, uh, our local maker space, the Valley Makers Association, and opened up this uh, space for people to come and produce the things that they that they love. And what I've kind of, I'll admit, was kind of a, uh, I didn't realize it would happen, but a lot of people in that organization were making things to sell. And I said, oh, wait, there's a whole group <laughs> of people here that are like, not just fixing yes. their people. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's, there's an opportunity here, right? Um, and so with that, you know, organization, that's how I kind of ended up learning about SCCF and the work that they do in the region. And we partnered on a grant uh, and, and they said, you know, Hey, we we're looking to hire. Can you share this with your network? And I said, actually, let me just go ahead and apply for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's kind of how I ended up there. Um, but it was always kind of part of, of who I was. And I don't think that I recognized that until much later. I don't think I used the word entrepreneur, right. Until oh, much later in life, it was always, you know, 
we're starting this side business or we're doing this thing. Um, and that just, you know, going back to your point about like understanding the language that that can be a big issue in an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. If, you know, people are talking about entrepreneurism and it means different things to different people. Um, and so when you're working in ecosystem building, creating that shared language is, is so pivotal to the success of any, any region or any, you know, location. Yes, that is so, that is so good, Ryan. Shared language, because sometimes we can sit around and use acronyms and use all these <laughs> words. And in Nashville, it may mean something different than what it means in the Valley and being That's able to true. communicate that uh, to those in your network. And, and, and you just shared how important connecting and networking is for other opportunities. I tell students that all the time. Are you networking? I have never applied for a job because I was in a network and they knew what I was good at and they just offered me jobs. I've never had to apply <laughs> for any job that I've, I've, I've received because I'm always out there. I, I said, that's part of my gift is just to connect and network and find out who's doing what and connect people. Uh, but it, it is critical uh, in the in the area of entrepreneurship for that for that to happen. One of the things that you mentioned is uh, in reference to the maker space. Mm -hmm. Where do you see do you do, where do you see that going down the road? Where do you see there is more of a need for maker spaces for different sectors? What are you hearing out there? What's kind of happening in the valley? Yeah, yeah, I think. Um... You know, I've been uh, lucky enough to connect with a, a national maker organization called Nation of Makers, and they really do a lot of work at um, that national level guiding kind of uh, discussions like this. And what's interesting to see, particularly after COVID, right, um, a lot of maker spaces uh well, a lot of makers in general uh, are problem solvers, right? Are, are innately, they've got kind of that entrepreneurial um, uh, love of solving big issues. And so when COVID happened and there was a shortage of uh, masks and face shields and things like that, you saw makerspaces across the country step up and produce them. Locally, wow. our makerspace produced like 10,000 masks um, wow. and distributed them across like five or five or six counties, um, just to different organizations and um, nonprofits and things of that nature. And it was a it was a big it was a big undertaking for us, right? We're a pretty small organization, but we were able to accomplish it with partner groups and things like that. And this happened, you know, again across the country, probably across the globe. Um, millions of PPP were produced or PPE were produced, you know, globally um, in these in these groups. And so there's now this recognition that these places can be, you know, a big driver of, of local or regional manufacturing and could be a solution to some of the supply chain issues that we've seen, right? If you've yes. got, you know, and it's not going to solve every problem, let's be realistic, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a local group of, of, folks who are able to manufacture and produce things and and oftentimes at a pretty large scale if given enough runway you know that really strengthens almost everything about your, your regional economy from yeah. workforce to, to tax revenue i mean it just goes up the chain and so i you know my that's that's i think where maker spaces are headed and my 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 hope and my vision is that they become an integral part of economic development across the country. And um, I think uh, if you want to follow up on this, uh, the place to watch right now is Maryland. They have some, mm. some policy going through that may kind of enact the first kind of uh, chain of, of maker spaces across, across that state, wow. um, which may be a proving ground for, for the maker movement and kind of, solidify us i think in in that world so anyway yes <laughs> yes that's fascinating i love i love that and i i never thought about and i heard about many uh, even starting business just making masks i was telling right. students i said when there is an issue like a pandemic figure out okay what's happening in that issue 
that I can start something, create something that's going to impact it and make, I say, because many people have made a lot of money off masks. If they got in initially and didn't wait to say, oh, we're not going to be wearing them long. I'm not getting in. It's not going to last long. And they're, then they started initially, they've made right. tons of money. Yeah. And so figuring out when those things happen, how do we respond to a pandemic? And in reference to the pandemic, what have you seen with small startups, uh, how they were impacted? Are we seeing many of them not being around anymore or did they push through and pivot quick enough to be able to sustain their, their businesses? Yeah, I think, um, you know, and, and this is kind of anecdotal. This is just what I've, what I've seen in my work. Um, it it kind of depends on the sector. There, there have been some places that, that have, you know, hurt, uh, but I think for the folks that have been able to pivot, I mean, look at restaurants, right? Being yes. able to open up, they they took a big hit, but a lot of them found creative ways to manage yeah, or mitigate yeah. those those challenges by opening up uh, different hours. They now do delivery. They, you know, have expanded outdoor seating or, you know, just so many different creative ways uh, that I I believe we're going to continue to see uh, as a staple in the restaurant world, right? Moving forward, I think that we're going to continue to see some of those things, and that that'll just be the way that restaurants do business now, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting. I think yeah. as on entrepreneurship as a whole, um, it's it's pretty clear, and the data is already out there, kind of illustrating this. But we're seeing more and more and more people uh, start their own business, right? They they want to kind of break free from the company or the job that they were in and do their own thing and be their own boss and take, see if they can take their idea to the next level. And I think that, you know, being home um, and, you know, being around your family and, and reevaluating what it means to, you know, have a, a stable work environment or a stable, you know, professional environment has really prompted a lot of people to, to take that leap. And it's really, mm -hmm. really so we're seeing more entrepreneurism uh, kind of across the board, I think. Yes. So this next month, March, is going to be Women's History Month. And yeah. uh, it just brings me to uh, really thinking about women and minority-owned businesses and some of the barriers to entry. Uh, and yeah. I know you guys are doing a lot of work around that. Uh, what do you think are some of the barriers, especially when it comes to capital for women and minority owned uh, entrepreneurs or startups? Uh, what is some of the barriers or what are some of the things that you've seen that they don't realize they need to have in place in order for them to even begin that process of getting capital or getting uh, funding for their their startups? Yeah, yeah, I think that. Um... That's a big challenge nationally, right? Um, there are um, so many generational issues that come into play here that have affected minority communities for years. Um, and so there is not as much, there's just blanket across the board, not as much access to capital for women and minority owned businesses in this country. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that the thing that could help, um, one, there are resources available, right? There are free resources available in the state of Virginia. We have wonderful mm -hmm. small business development centers that can coach you through building your first financial, uh, financial documents like a cash flow projection or, you know, putting together a sound profit and loss statement, all of that information, um, you know, is at your fingertips. You just have to go ask for it and find those people that have that information, have that knowledge. Um, there are other organizations like us, entrepreneurial support organizations that provide um, support in those ways as well. And in other ways, um, there are some really great programs uh, like the SBA microloan program, it's it's non-credit based lending, right? So we're not going to deny you based on your credit score. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we don't use that as a determining factor. So we're really looking at like, 
did you do the due diligence? Did you do the research? Um, you know, those sorts of things. And then there are some really, really great programs that, um, you know, work with different organizations like Black Men Ventures and Black Girl Ventures. Those pitch competitions are, are really, really impactful mm -hmm. to meet folks in our community. Um, and so I, I would say, do exactly what you <laughs> suggested and start networking, start looking for these groups and 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 see where they are in your community um, and reach out to people like Yolanda and myself and, and we will connect you. And if we don't know, we probably know someone who knows, right? Um, and and really entrepreneurism uh, and entrepreneurial support is is one of those things that it's a rising tide that lifts all ships, right? And so we wanna help mm -hmm. everyone that we can and make a more thriving ecosystem. Yes, that's so good, Ryan. It's it's about being aware of the resources that are out there because me sitting at a table and I'm hearing about resources and I'm thinking, people don't know this stuff. They don't realize these, these support systems and this funding and pitch competitions. And it, it is really for us to continue to do the work that we're doing with educating uh, networking and training those that are interested in starting a business so that they are aware that these services are available. And some people have this fear of the, the unknowns that, and then finding those that have already gone through it to be able to share with those newbies coming in so that they don't feel so like, is this for me too, or just for them? Right, and so right. Maybe being able to take away some of that fear, because I hear that all the time when I'm talking to young entrepreneurs, women, minority and non-minority, just that fear of the unknown or can I can I even qualify? And the credit right. piece, I'm glad you shared that because the credit piece keeps a lot of them from even right. applying uh, right. for some of that funding. Well, I will so, say too, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of both ways. I think I kind of, you know, you know, you do need to reach out, and and that's one way. Um, but as a resource provider, you know, we have to be in the communities that we're trying to serve to. So yes. you know, making sure that we're getting out and going to community meetings and um, speaking engagements, and you know, we can't just stay in our offices and that. No, it doesn't solve any problems, right? We have to go out and, and do that connecting as well. So, yeah, not in our office and expecting them to come to us. That right. that does exactly. that, that does not work. That does not yeah. work. <laughs> and so, I want to end our conversation with you sharing one last time about your upcoming. I know there. You know, we did the seventy-two hour tech starts in at Shenandoah University several months ago. Now there's one at JMU coming up. Could you share mm -hmm. a little bit about that? And then the newest group that's starting uh, next month with SCCF. Yeah, yeah. So um, we uh, also help organize um, Techstars Startup Weekends throughout the region. Uh, and as Yolanda mentioned, we had a really successful one at Shenandoah University uh, at, in the fall of last year. So our next one, we're moving a little further south down the valley and we are hosting our next Techstar Startup Weekend uh, at James Madison University. Um, and we have a pretty exciting group of mentors and judges lined up for that. Um, I'm really, really, um, I'm really excited to see how that how that turns out. We have we have so much fun at those events. Um, yes, and, I know it's, and they it can, have an engineering school, so it is it can even bring additional groups right. in. And I used to see that all the time at Vanderbilt University. So I'm excited for that for you guys. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the next round of uh, Startup Shenandoah Valley uh, should launch. Um, May, uh, March 14th, rather, excuse me. Um, and so you should see a press release about all of the new entrepreneurs that we have that are going through that accelerator. And this time we're focusing specifically on technology and technology enabled yeah. businesses. So um, it's going to be a, a slightly different twist for us. And so I'm excited to see, you know, who these folks are, who they're going to be and, and kind of present uh, kind of the face of rural tech entrepreneurship, I guess, for the Shenandoah Valley. Yes, to let the tech community know we have people too. 
There are people in the Shenandoah Valley that's doing technology startups and you don't have to, you can go to Northern Virginia if you want to, but you, we want to, people to see that you don't have to be, and what's right. available. I do that a lot with students. They're like, I'm going back home because there's no companies here. So I start having uh, companies come in, American Woodwork, they're, they will pay for their housing and all of that as an intern during the summer and all the benefits right. and just just as we said earlier, letting people know what those resources are. What are the companies that are in the Valley that are hiring and paying great salaries? Or what are those opportunities for you to even start start your own company in the Valley with the resources that, that are here? And so thank you so much, Ryan, for coming and hanging out with me for a little bit with conversations with Yolanda. And I look forward to really seeing more of the work you guys are doing in the Valley and those entrepreneurs that are being created and supported throughout the ecosystem. So thank you so much. Could you share with the people how they can find SCCF online? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our website is the best place to go and the address is sccfvaforvirginia.org. Great, great. And are you on Instagram and Facebook oh, yes. or LinkedIn? They can find you in those places as well. All of those places plus TikTok. We we're everywhere. Oh, TikTok. Okay. Yeah. That's yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is great. So Ryan, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me. And I look forward to continuing to watch the work and the impact you guys are having in the valley. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Yolanda. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.